So as Dean of Learning and Teaching in the College of Science and Engineering, I'd like to welcome you to this general interest seminar from the School of Physics and Astronomy, and also jointly hosted by the Institute for Academic Development. Um, also extend a welcome to those people. I don't know if they can see me, but I hope they can hear me on the, uh, the webcast of this lecture. Um, but most of all, it's a great pleasure to welcome and introduce today's speaker, Eric Mazur, Professor of Physics and Applied Physics at Harvard University. I think it's no exaggeration to say that Eric, as a scientist, excels in really all three areas of academic scholarship, of research, of commercialization and knowledge exchange, and of teaching, development, and delivery. He's a distinguished researcher in optical physics with over 230 scientific publications and 12 patents. In 2006, he set up a company to commercialize black silicon, a material developed in his lab. But he's here to give us a talk today on another element of his repertoire for which he's equally well-renowned, and that's in the area of physics education research. Over 20 years ago, he began developing an instructional technique that's become known as peer instruction. He did quite literally write the book on this technique, as I'm sure many of you realize. As a method, as an educational method, it's been adopted far beyond the subject of physics in many universities all over the world. And it's profoundly changed the way that lecturers view and use the face-to-face -face class time in lecture theaters like this with students. Eric's talk today is going to describe his journey from a traditional lecturer to a converted lecturer. So please join me in welcoming him to deliver his talk. Wow, there are a lot of you here. I guess you must all like public confessions. <laughs> Frankly, it's a bit intimidating. I'd rather do this one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, I guess I just have to remind myself of the American proverb, the more you confess, the more books you will sell. <laughs> anyway, let's get started. First confession. When I started teaching at uh, Harvard, a long time ago, 1984, so that's 27 years ago, oh, really? Is it? Yeah, it is 27 years ago. When I started teaching, I never asked myself the question, how am I going to do this? Which is sort of odd, right? When you start doing something that you haven't done before, that's the first question that uh, should come up in your mind. Didn't. It was perfectly clear to me how I was going to teach. I was going to do to my students what my teachers had done to me. Well, in fact, it was almost an unconscious decision. Uh, and I think in retrospect, and in my own self-defense, it's not that surprising, right? You tend to project your own experiences onto the world around you, see it through your own eyes. And I naively thought that I had learned everything I knew in the classroom, taking notes in a setting not very different from, from this one. Anyway, so I started lecturing, and um, as a beginning assistant professor at Harvard, I was asked to teach the course that none of my colleagues wanted to teach, the leftover course, Physics for Pre-Medical Students. <laughs> they didn't want to learn physics. They were postponing the course as long as they could to their junior or senior year, but they had to take it because it was a requirement, a pre-medical requirement. And, you know, most of these students have heard nothing but horror stu stories about physics. So they're not uh, predisposed to being very friendly to their physics instructors. And, but, you know, what happened to me was that very quickly the signs that I was receiving were that I was a good teacher. By the traditional standards, I was doing a good job. What are the traditional standards? Well, I can think of two of them. One is the dreaded end-of-semester questionnaire. 
most of my colleagues when they taught that course would come close to committing suicide at the end of the semester when they saw the remarks that the students made about their teaching. But not so for me. We use a five-point scale and I would get 4.2, 4.8 on a five-point scale, anywhere in that range. So clearly the students were happy with what I did in the classroom. So that's one metric. What's another metric? Another metric is to look at the performance of the students on exams. And normally when um, physics is taught to pre-medical students in the US, I don't, uh, I don't know how it is here in the UK, but if it's a physics course in the US for pre-medical students, you avoid calculus. It's an algebra-based course. Not so at Harvard, we give them a full-blown calculus-based course. And I could give these students some pretty complicated exam problems. Exam problems that I wasn't quite sure I would do well under the time pressure of an exam involving triple integrations and you name it. And by and large, the students did well. So in short, they liked what I was doing, they did well on what I considered complicated exams. Obviously, I was doing the right thing. That went on for, I don't know, six, seven years until something happened that made me tumble out of my ivory tower. But before I got there, I, I should tell you that all along there were signs that something was wrong, but I simply ignored those signs. Let me give you an example. In spite of giving me high ratings on my end of semester questionnaire, some students would write down, physics is boring, or physics sucks. I never knew what how to make any sense out of those remarks, so I, I just focused on the positive one. I'm somebody who likes to focus on the positive, so I focused on the positives and ignored those negatives. Same thing, you know, when I go to a party and people ask me what I do for a living, I say I'm a physicist. Oh, I had such a hard time with physics in high school or in college. Or my dentist who recently told me, and I couldn't even talk back because I had the thing in my mouth. <laughs> oh, you're a physicist. I got an A for physics in college, but I really didn't understand anything. It always creates a sense of embarrassment, and especially, you know, I, I, I never knew how, where, where these remarks were coming from. Like, I could not imagine how somebody would think of physics. The science that explains how the work, world around us works could be conceived as being boring. So to me, it didn't make any sense, and, and I ignored it. But then in um, 1990, I read about a series of articles in a journal called the American Journal of Physics, which I normally didn't read that often, which occasionally has an article about education. Now, before I continue, I should, um, I should add a little disclaimer. I mean, I'm a physicist, so I will use the word physics a few times, and I'll give you a few examples containing physics, but this talk is not about physics, and I'm sure that a lot of what I'm going to be confessing about is equally applicable to your own discipline. So if you're a chemist in the audience, just substitute the word chemistry every time I say physics. And if you know humanities, do the same thing. I, I'm sure there will be something of value to any, any discipline represented in this audience. There will, however, be a few examples of physics, simply because I want to make what I'm saying concrete. Don't worry if you don't understand the physics, because it's not about the physics, it's about the ideas and the education and the pedagogy. So in order to explain to you what happened in 1990, I have to describe the content of those articles to you. There's a series of four articles and the first one descri it's described a test called the Force Concept Inventory. It's a uh, 30 question, at that time it was 29, but it's been revised since, now it's 30 questions, survey of uh, a set of 29 or 30 questions testing students' conceptual understanding of Newtonian mechanics, essentially Newton's three laws. Well, the typical curriculum in physics is as follows. The first few weeks, one or two, are spent describing motion, acceleration, velocity, because if you don't understand motion, it's very hard to describe anything in physics. And then comes the connection between forces and motion, as embodied by Newton's three laws. And then everything else builds on top of that. If you don't understand, have a solid understanding of Newtonian mechanics in a physics course, it is very, very difficult to make sense out of anything else. Yes, you can maybe do the procedures, but to actually make sense is very hard. 
Let me give you what turns out to be the hardest question on this FCI, Force Concept Inventory. A heavy truck and a light car collide head-on. The force, during the collision, the force exerted by the heavy truck on the light car is A, larger than that of the light car on the heavy truck. B, they're equal to one another. C, the light car exerts a larger force on the heavy truck than the other way around. D, they're not exerting any force on each other, they are just in each other's way. <laughs> now you're laughing about that. I think no physicist in his right mind would ever come up with such a, an answer, you see. And that's the difficulty of designing a multiple choice question. If you know your field, it's very easy to come up with the right answer, but it's very difficult to come up with plausible wrong answers because your mind doesn't work the way the mind of a student works. So the way Professor Histones, who was the author of this test, physics professor, now retired at uh, Arizona State University, the way he designed this test was not by trying to invent correct distractors for the multiple choice test. No, he gave them a free response question and then tabulated the most frequent incorrect responses given by the students. And this was one of them, and there's another one which I can't remember because my mind doesn't work that way. Now, in spite of the fact that most students have no trouble reciting Newton's third law, which says action is reaction, the force of A on B is the same magnitude as the force of B on A, when B and A are replaced by small car and heavy truck, all of a sudden they forget about Newton's third law. And they're convinced that the heavy truck exerts a larger force on the small car than the other way around. Now, in another article, Hessler shows data that he had collected in about, uh, in, in a, you know, about half a dozen different universities and, and high schools in the southwestern U.S., California, New Mexico, Arizona. And um, the interesting thing is that this test does not contain any jargon. For example, when I told you the question I just told you, you probably in your mind were starting to already formulate it an answer before I reminded you of Newton's third law. There's no jargon, there's a word like force, but we develop a concept of this notion of force long before we take a physics course, or even if you don't, you can stop anybody here in the street of Edinburgh and ask them any of the questions and they'll formulate an answer. They can even probably articulate the reasoning behind it, not necessarily the right answer. That means that you can give this test to a student before instruction and then you can repeat it at the end of the semester to see how much the instruction has done to change misconceptions that students had entering in the course. And one of the things that Heston has showed was that there's hardly any gain. Doesn't make that much difference if you <laughs> test them at the beginning of the semester or at the end of the semester. In fact, there's not even correlation with end of semester ratings of professors. Award-winning teachers those that, you know, we, we, we recognize publicly end up not doing any better than the worst dull, dry, boring teachers you can imagine. So I looked at that and I thought, no way. You know, not my students, not, not Harvard students. I, f I felt challenged. You know, to me, this was high school stuff. And most of the students at Harvard University have taken an advanced placement physics course on which they've earned five out of five, the highest score in order to try to place out of a physics course, but you know, we don't let them place out. Um, so I, 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 uh, I thought this was not something that had any relationship to what I was doing in the classroom, but I felt challenged. I thought, you know, I'm going to show that in my class the results are very different. Now, unfortunately, it was too late to do a pretest. We were already halfway into the semester. But I was dying to show that my students would ace this, uh, this uh, test. So one day, I just walked into the classroom and I said, look, I'm going to give you a quiz. You know, if you say test to a pre-med, he or she freaks out, right? So I said, I'm going to do a quiz. You don't have to worry about this quiz. It's not going to affect your final grade in any way. It's just to measure the efficacy of my own teaching. As soon as I said that, I realized I'd taken away all, any incentive to take that quiz, right? Because if you tell a, <laughs> if you tell a pre med, it's not going to be, it's not going to affect your final grade. They won't even show up. So I thought I better give them a reason for actually coming. I said, look, next week we have a midterm examination coming up. If you take this 
quiz, seriously, it will help you pinpoint any difficulty you have. As soon as I said that, I realized I told them a huge lie. <laughs> I mean, we were, you know, discussing rotational dynamics. They had to, for the physicists and engineers among you, they had to apply the parallel axis theorem, calculate the moments of inertia of three-dimensional objects by carrying out triple integrations. I mean, this was so way beyond the question and the types of question I just mentioned. It wasn't even funny anymore. So I was worried that my students would get mad at me for wasting their time with something so trivial. Oh boy, were my worries quickly dispelled because hardly had they taken their seats in the computer classroom where we administered this test. Or one student raised her hand and she said, Professor Mazur, how should I answer these questions? According to what you taught me or according to the way I usually think about these things? <laughs> I had no idea how to answer that question. <laughs> and by the time the test had been completed, I had been dragged out of my ivory tower. And it was clear that there was something really serious uh, going on. Anyway, what I'd like to do in the next 50 minutes or so is get this point across. That's my message. In case you doze off, I want to get it, get it in right now. I, I promise you, I won't make you doze off. I'll keep you awake. But is namely that we should shift the focus from teaching to helping students learn. The idea of teaching is sort of almost a myth. You can't put the knowledge in, in people's head. The best I think I can do now is help students learn. Now, the more I, I, I've given this talk many times, and the more I, I say the statement, the more obvious it becomes to me. And maybe it was already obvious to you, but I'll, I'll add some meat to that statement over the coming 40 minutes or so. And I'll do that in three parts. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about education. Many of us here are involved in education. We're doing it. We're at an educational institution. But if we were to all take a little piece of paper, and I'd give you a minute or two to write down a concise definition of the word education without pulling out your Blackberries and iPhone and looking, looking it up online. But even if you do that, the definition you find in the dictionary is not very illuminating. I think many of us would actually struggle to define what it is that we mean by education. Which is weird, right? Because we're doing education, so we should not have any trouble defining what it is. Well, I'd like to talk about that a little bit. What is it exactly, and what is it that we're trying to accomplish? What do we mean when we say we're educating people? Then I'd like to tell you about peer instruction, what I did in response to this rather disheartening discovery that my students weren't learning nearly as much as I wanted. In fact, they were learning next to nothing, as I will show you, because they didn't even internalize uh, Newton's laws. And then lastly, I'll show you some results, because I think it's very important that we all apply the same scholarship, the same rigor, to our approach to teaching as we do in our own disciplines. I'm, I'm often shocked in my own department of physicists. When I joined the physics department, there were we have 27 faculty, six of them had won the Nobel Prize. I mean, you, can't, you can hardly think of a more distinguished body of, uh, of faculty. And, but whenever over at faculty lunches the discussion would talk to education, any hint of scientific approach, any hint of the scientific method would disappear promptly. It's no longer, it would no longer be about you know, hypothesis, collecting data, disproving or, or solidifying the hypothesis. I mean, nothing of this iterative, iterative process of advancing the approach to <coughs> teaching. No. My students like it when I do a lot of demonstrations. Yeah, so what? I, now, I, 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 back then, I didn't dare to ask any such questions. <laughs> or, you know, uh, my students learn a lot better when I solve a lot of problems on the backboard. Well, what do you mean, learn a lot better? What are the data? Show me the data. I think it's important that we, we be as rigorous, that we collect data. And it, in a sense, I see my classroom as an opportunity to gather data. And I'll show you data. That's why I have that section of my talk. Lee Schulman, who used to be the president of the Carnegie Foundation in the US, has a marvelous quote. So next time you talk to a colleague who tries to use anecdotal evidence to prove that one method of instruction is better than the other, you may want to quote this. The quote is the following. The plural of anecdote is not data. 
I think it's a great quote. I mean, you don't validate an argument simply by, by telling a lot of anecdotes. That being said, I'll give you a lot of anecdotes just to keep <laughs> you awake. Okay, so let's start with education. This is a picture of me teaching before I, um, I uh, converted. And uh, I'm standing there at the overhead projector projecting uh, my notes. And um, in a space that's not very different from this space and probably not very different from 99.99% of all learning spaces around the globe, all dating back to the ancient Greek amphitheater, designed with one sole purpose, to focus the attention of many onto a few. The performers, the you know, theater, music, whatever, or teacher in this case. I would like you to describe to me the process that is occurring there on the screen behind me <coughs> in a few words. And, and I don't want that, and ideally I want a verb too, and I don't want that verb to be either teaching or learning. So what, what is the activity that is taking place on the screen here? Transmitting. Well, you must have heard my talk before. <laughs> <laughs> what is being transmitted? Facts. Facts. Yeah. Facts or information. And I, I, think, I think perhaps the, the best way of characterizing the lecture is to say that it's, it's a process whereby information gets transferred from the instructor to uh, the students. So sort of ironic because the word lecture means exactly that. It's a reading, right? It's a reading of information. And I think before the invention of the book, this was probably the only way of transmitting information from one generation to another. Of course, Gutenberg invented the book 500 years ago, so why didn't we abandon this lecture process, this lecture method 500 years ago? Well, at least until the Industrial Revolution, I guess books were not a commodity. But you know what? My students had actually rubbed it in my face that that's what I was doing. And I actually got upset about it when they rubbed this in my face. Let me tell you what happened. When I was assigned that um, course, <coughs> Physics 11b, and um, the, the, the question that came up in my mind was not how am I going to teach? Guess what the question, first question was that came up in my mind? What, or more precisely, what book am I going to use? So I went to a colleague who had taught the course before, and I said, what book do you use in this course? And he said, oh, we use um, Haldane and Resnick, and you should order copies for all of the students. And Haldane and Resnick, physicists among you, I see some shake their heads. It's been a classic for, what, 60 years? I don't know, for a long time. Anyway, so I went to the bookstore and I ordered 150 copies of Haldi and Resnick because I heard that that's what needed to be done. Now, I don't know how it is in the UK, but where I got educated across the uh, channel in, in Holland, you wouldn't buy a book, certainly not an introductory course. I mean, why buy a book? Why spend $150 or the equivalent of $150 if the instructor is presenting the material to you? So. But anyway, I ordered the book, and, and I, as I walked back from the bookstore to my uh, office, I thought, wait a minute, if all the students have the book, what am I going to do? <laughs> so I went back to my colleague, and I asked him that question. He said, don't worry, and he pointed at his collection of introductory physics textbooks and a whole shelf of them. He says, there are many introductory physics textbooks, so just pick another one. So, <laughs> So I looked at the books and very quickly there was one that I really, really liked for two reasons. One, it, has a somewhat, it had a somewhat different approach. Rather than starting with you know, Newtonian mechanics, it started with conservational momentum and I really liked that. So, but the real reason why I eventually chose that book was it was out of print. <laughs> Students couldn't get their hand on the book. So it was the perfect book to prepare my lecture notes from. So I prepared lecture notes from that book and then in class I would either project the lecture notes or I would write them on the board, right there behind the, the letters that you see. And because my approach was different, I decided to hand out a copy of my lecture notes to the students. So as they would walk out of the classroom at the end, at the back we had a stack of photocopied lecture notes for them to take with them home. Why do you think I handed them out at the end of class? 
so they have to come to Christ. So they, so they wouldn't just take him and go away. But, you know, isn't that already admitting that there's something wrong? <laughs> Right? Because why force? Is this some sort of an ego trip that we have? That we, we want them to actually come and listen us, professors, deliver the information? Right? If they can get the same information by just reading the lecture notes, then why not do it that way? Anyway, that, that question didn't even come up in my mind. But what did happen was that after about three or four weeks, some students came to me and they said, Professor Mazur, couldn't we get a copy of your lecture notes at the beginning of each class period? This way we don't have to write down that much. And I had indeed noticed that each time my chalk went A on the blackboard, 150 pens went A in the notebooks of the students. I once heard somebody describe the lecture method as a process whereby the lecture notes of the instructor get transferred to the notebooks of the students without passing through the brains of either. <laughs> Well, that's precisely what was happening in my class. I was taking all this time to take the information out of the book, transfer it into my lecture notes, and then in class the lecture notes were transferred to the notebooks of the students, but the place where the information really needed to get, the brains, didn't, didn't get there. So I started to hand out the lecture notes at the beginning of each class period. And much to my relief, the students wouldn't just walk in, grab the notes, and walk out. No. They walked in, grabbed a copy of the notes, sat down, and they still copied everything because they had no time to read the notes. Next time that I was teaching that same course, I said, you know what, rather than handing out these notes piecemeal, I'm going to take the whole collected set of lecture notes at the beginning of the term, send it out for duplication. On day one, every student gets a complete packet of the notes for the entire semester. You know what the unexpected result was? At the end of the semester, half a dozen students wrote in the comments section of their end of semester evaluation, Professor Mazur lectures straight from his lecture notes. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> I mean, what was I supposed to do? Develop another set of lecture notes to lecture from that was different from the lecture notes I handed out? I was mad. These ungrateful students. But you know, if you stop to think about it, they had a point. I was focusing on delivering information. So that leads us to the question, is that what education is? Is education the transfer of information? Can I see any hands in favor of that statement? None. So you must all have a good idea of what education is. Please tell me. What is missing? Thinking about something. Thinking and, about something. And internalizing. Internalizing something. Interaction between the teacher and the student. Interaction between the student and the teacher. Any other? Making meaning. Making sense, making meaning. That's right. It's not enough just to have that information and then only be able to replicate that information. We want students to do more, right, with whatever we teach them. We, we, in fact, we want our students to solve problems that we have not yet solved, right? We want the, the next generation to be able to solve problems that this generation has not solved. Unfortunately, I think a lot of edu education is completely focused on replication. The professor delivers the information to the students. The students regurgitate that same information back on the exam. You ask a question that deviates a little bit in context or otherwise from what has been taught, and the student says, Professor, we've never seen a problem of this type, or we've never done anything like this. Well, think about it. You want to create or maybe stimulate people to be able to later solve problems they've never seen before, not only problems they've seen, because a problem you've seen and solved before is no longer a problem, by definition, right? Anyway, so I think the important part is that, you know, students, as you said, need to, I don't remember what the word was, you said internalize, I would say assimilate that information, you need to build a mental model, you need to be able to distill out of that information something that you can apply in a different context. Well, this first became clear when I uh, gave this um, force concept inventory. Here are the data that I promised you before. I, in, 1990, in 1990, I taught a completely uh, traditional lecture-based test. Um, the, um, 
the uh, FCI has 29 questions, so the maximum score is 29 out of 29. Um, here's the count. So if you realize that many questions have three or four choices, if you put a monkey just randomly pressing buttons uh, on the screen, you get a score of about 10. So you see that there are some Harvard students who barely do better than a gorilla, <laughs> right? Heston says, I wanted my students to be in the last three bins. That's what I had expected. Um, but this is at the beginning, right? This is not the post-test, right? After I taught them, I expected them to be in the last three bins. When I took the test, I got 28 out of 29. I guess I must have misread a question or something. <laughs> I actually made a real mistake. Heston says that anybody who scores below 23 is still partially an Aristotelian thinker connecting force and velocity rather than force and acceleration. Right? Uh, well, if you, if you are an Aristotelian thinker, it's really, really very hard to make any sense out of anything else in physics. And as you can see at Harvard, in spite of them having a five on this advanced placement course, some two-thirds or maybe even three-quarters of students scores below this cutoff for Newtonian thinking. Well, that's of course at the beginning of the term, so I can't take any responsibility for these data. Let's see what happens after one semester of, you know, highly rated teaching by yours truly here. You ready? There we go. At least there's a gain. <laughs> but it's not that much as you see, and we still have some, uh, you know, gorilla level students, and, in, and still more than half below 23. Let's plot that a little bit differently. Here you can see the, the students that moved up, right? Uh, I put the two distributions on top of one another. But I'm going to show this slightly differently so we can compare it to other universities. Um, we put the initial class average score, so we take this blue distribution and then take the average, which was about 70%, so right here, on the horizontal scale. And then we put the gain, the difference between the average of the red distribution and the average of the blue distribution on the vertical scale. Well, they went from 70% to 78%, so the gain is only 8%, there's the data point. Where did I want the data point to be? Well, as close as possible to perfect final score, perfect post-test score, right? If you start at 70, you can gain 30. If you start at 20, you can gain 80, and so forth. So this is the Harvard result, the first one I obtained. Let's contain it now to other, compare it now to other schools from two-year community colleges, which are very different types of institutions, and large state universities, and so on. Here are some data that were collected by a professor at Indiana University, thousands of students. And here you see some two-year colleges and some large state schools, small liberal arts schools, and here a lone Ivy League school. Notice that the community college student actually gained more than the Harvard students. Nearly 20%, right? Versus 8% for the Harvard students. Of course, they start much lower. They start at what? 28 or so. So they end up, even if you add 28 and 20, they end up lower than where the Harvard students began. But notice that there's a trend here. These were all traditionally taught courses. In all cases, the data point lie about a quarter of the way where the maximum score is, right? They gain about 20, whereas they could have gained close to 80. They gain 8, whereas they could have gained close to 30, right? So it's a quarter. Roughly. So the, regardless of the setting, the traditional lecture gets about a quarter of the maximum possible normalized gain on, uh, on this FCI. Well, so it's not just the transfer, that's in, because that's what happened in all of these courses that's important, but the assimilation thereof. Where did it happen for us? I've often asked myself the question, where did I learn what I learned? Did it happen? in the classroom as I was listening to the instructor and taking notes? Think about it for yourself. Is that where the learning happened? I, get, I see many people shake no, no. It probably happened outside when we struggled with the material, when we went over our notes. And we went over our notes because we were interested in discipline, otherwise we would never have become professors in the discipline. But can we expect the same from our student, especially if they're, let's say, a pre-medical student who's interested in a career in medicine? No, probably not, because we certainly did not put the same effort into other disciplines than we did in our, in our, in our own. Now, when I, when I saw that result, I thought for a moment, well, maybe, Eric, you're not such a good teacher after all. But 
that could obviously not be true, right? So, <laughs> so I discarded that right away. So, so how, I mean, I, I was trying to explain how this poor result had occurred. So I thought, you know, maybe, maybe I'm dumb students. But you know, Harvard selects a very thin <laughs> slice, so that, that, that couldn't be true too. So I thought about it a little bit, and then my twisted mind came up with the perfect excuse. Put yourself in my position. I tried to explain why students' gain was, that gain was so low. What would you have concluded? Can I hear some suggestions? They weren't studying. They weren't studying, but that would be the students again, right? I mean, the what? The test was wrong, of course, there had to be something wrong with the test. I mean, think about it. Heavy truck, light car. I mean, we know sort of intuitively that the effect of the impact is going to be much less on the truck than on the car. So maybe the students were confusing damage or putting in the, the whole idea of inertia. Maybe it was just a matter of semantics. After all, if I asked them to solve a problem involving Newton's third law, they applied it fine. So I thought maybe it's just a matter of semantics. So I decided to do some testing of my own. And that's when I discovered another really important point, namely that the conventional way that we assess our students is very misleading. Let me give you an explicit example, and this will be the last physics that I will show to you. And again, it's not important if you don't understand the underlying physics. What I did is I decided, first of all, to stay away from mechanics and Newtonian, because we all have these intuitive notions of force acceleration and so on, right? But circuits, electrical circuits, we have very little intuitive notions about it. And I decided to take two problems, one traditional straight out of the textbook and another one which would be verbal qualitative. I'll show them both to you. So this was the problem that was straight out of the textbook. Three resistors, those are the thing with the little wiggly lines, and two <coughs> batteries and the students were asked to calculate the current in the two ohm resistor and the potential difference between the points P and Q. If we were to ask the physicist here and the mechanical or electrical engineers to solve this problem, you know, it would take 10 minutes. It's not a very complicated problem. It's about maybe two thirds of a page of equations. But I'm sure that if after 10 minutes we'd compare our answers, we'd find a range of answers because it's very easy to make a mistake. There's ample opportunity to make mistakes. And I'm sure that many of us, including myself, would wrong minus sign or whatever. Well, this was problem number five out of five on a midterm examination. On that same examination, I put this question. Three identical light bulbs, A, B, C, are connected in series, one after the other to a battery, much like the lights in a Christmas tree. And then here there's this switch S that shorts out the last light bulb. Don't do this at home tonight. It's dangerous, okay? I don't want to give you any bad ideas here. Now, the question that the students were asked, so a short, by the way, means that all of the current goes through that short. It has no resistance or nearly zero resistance, so nothing would go through C anymore. It would all go through that, that short once the switch is closed. Uh, the students were asked the following question. When that switch S is closed, what happens to the intensity of A and B? What happens to the intensity of C? What happens to the current through the battery? What happens to the potential differences across A, B, C? And what happens to the total power dissipated? And the only thing that students had to say was it increases, decreases, or stays the same. No calculations. I even told them that they didn't have to give a justification. I didn't insist on a justification. That's a bad idea because it's actually the reasoning that matters more than the answer. But anyway, uh, if you understand DC circuits, it takes 30 seconds to answer that question. And of those 25 seconds are spent on part E. You just answer the question. I mean, it's, it, once you understand the basics. In fact, what I didn't tell you at the beginning of this talk is that the large courses at Harvard are taught by two faculty members. We alternate weeks in order to free up the other faculty from interacting with the students. And that meant that in order to put this on the examination, I had to convince my colleague that this was a good examination problem. So I went to his office, I showed him a handwritten draft of this problem. He looked at it and he said, Eric, you're out of your mind. I said, uh, I don't think so. And uh, he had not been part of the fall semester, so he didn't know about the FCI and everything I just told you. Um, so I told him and, you know, I said, I really want to know it. I, uh, I, um, I felt it was my prerogative to put this on the exam because I had been the one teaching DC circuits. Anyway, he listened patiently and he said, but Eric, we only have five problems on the exam. We cannot give away 20%. <laughs> I said, well, I hope we're giving away, but I'm not sure. Well, we argued for <laughs> half an hour and he finally reluctantly 
agree to put it on the exam and we made it problem number one, you know, the warm-up problem. <laughs> Turns out the students overheated on this problem. <laughs> Professor Mazur said one student, this problem number one was the hardest problem on the exam. Or another student who said, uh, I, I, I didn't know how to get started. What do you mean getting started? If you started, you're done, right? <laughs> anyway, I said to the rest of the teaching staff, let me grade problem number one. Why? Because, you know, as I told you, I'd only asked the students to write increase, decrease, stays the same. So I thought that I could grade, at that time we had 250 students in the class, I thought I could do it in, you know, two hours, quickly go through it. Big mistake. <laughs> Big mistake. Some students had freaked out and written six pages in their examination <laughs> booklets. <laughs> writing down everything they knew about DC circuits in hopes of, you know, somehow saying the right thing. To the physicist here again, some students had talk, were talking about RC times. I have no idea. <laughs> anyway, and I had to read it all in order to see whether it was correct or not. So it took me a whole weekend to grade this. And by the time I'd finished the, the, the grading, it was clear that we had a problem. On the left, you see the conventional problem, the textbook problem, and the average was something like 7 out of 10. On the conceptual problem, that light bulb problem, the average was 5 out of 10. Do you see that huge peak at 2 here? Just to amuse the uh, electrical engineers and uh, physicists here, I have to tell you where that 2 comes from. Here's what most of the students in my class assumed, or half of them at least. When you close the switch S here, nothing happens to the current through A and B, right? After all, it doesn't know yet that the switch is closed because <laughs> it's further downstream. <laughs> right? So you're going to have the same current here, but now what happens at this junction, right? Before the switch is open, it can only go straight. When the switch is closed, it could go straight or take a right turn. <laughs> So the big question is, how much is going to take a right turn and how much is going to go straight? Well, what do you think 50% of Harvard students concluded? 50-50. <laughs> I already told you, if you make a short, it all goes through the short. But anyway, 50-50. Okay, so what, how would they answer this question? Intensity of A and B, nothing changes. Wrong, because with two light bulbs connected, you have more current, less resistance, therefore more current than with three. So they lost two points there. What about part B? Well, it gets half the current, so they wrote down decrease. You know what? That's where they got their two points. <laughs> Of course, it goes off, but I had to be fair. <laughs> now, these are some of the nation's brightest pre-meds. Some are going to be surgeons doing bypass surgery. <laughs> Pretty scary, huh? Anyway, these are the same students on the same day. So let's see if there's any correlation between the performance on one type of problem with that on the other. So let's plot for each student the performance on the conceptual problem versus that on the traditional problem to see if they measure the same thing. Well, I'm afraid I have to disappoint you. There is not much correlation. Data points all over the place. But if you're willing to stretch your definition of a line a little bit, <laughs> you find that about 50% does equally poorly or equally well on both types of problems. But now look around that line or band or whatever you want to call it. 40% lies below it. Which is not surprising, we, we already concluded that, right? They do quite well on the conventional problem, not that well on the conceptual problem. But now look here. This is almost empty. No data points. What does that mean? That means a student who understands the basic concepts is likely to do well on the traditional problem as well. But there's a large fraction of students who does well on the traditional problem but does not understand the concepts. Who are these students? 40% at Harvard. I challenge you to try something like this here, and you, you'll probably find something very similar. Who are those 40%? What are these students? Why are they there? How would you classify those students? You have them here too? Rogue learners. Rogue learners. Rogue learners. Uh, uh, we have a term for that in the, U in, in, in the U.S. I don't know if it's the same here. Plug and chug, right? They, they see a problem, they classify it, and then just follow a procedure. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of a student in my class, a pre-med, right? You're there not because you want to learn physics, but you have to. You know it's a high-stakes course because 
getting a good grade in physics might mean you get in a more competitive medical school. It might be the difference between getting in Johns Hopkins Medical School or, you know, the University of Nebraska Medical School. So, on an exam, you're nervous because you've heard nothing there but bad things. And President Mazur is distributing the exam. You probably remember those days that you were taking exam, right? You're, you're sitting one seat apart, you're, you're still looking through your notes quickly, sharpening your pencils, and the teaching staff is handing out the exam, printed side down. And at one point, the professor says, now put your notes away and you may begin. Turn silent and you can hear 150 exams being turned around. Now imagine you're one of these students and you look at, uh, you look at uh, the exam as you turn it around and you see this diagram. This one. Where? There. Right? You turn it around, you see that diagram. What is the first thought that crosses your mind? I want an answer from the electro engineers or physicist. What's the first thought that crosses your mind? V equals IR. V equals IR or Kirchhoff's, Kirchhoff's laws. Kirchhoff's laws are the laws, for those of you who don't know, that describe how currents distribute themselves in current. Why? Because you have to be pre programmed. If you see a diagram with wiggly lines, it means it's a Kirchhoff's law problem. <laughs> you haven't even read the text. <laughs> By the time a second into the exam, the exam has landed on its back, you already know that problem number five is a Kirchhoff's law problem. How much physics is left once you have made that identification? Physicists, engineers, none, right? It's just a matter of taking the numbers which are conveniently presented in a diagram <laughs> and putting them in the right spot in Kirchhoff's law and then turning the algebraic crank. It's not even calculus or anything, it's just simple algebra, high school algebra. And clearly most of the students in my class are pretty good at that. Do they understand Kirchhoff's laws? There's a reason I show you that. No, because if they understood Kirchhoff's laws, they would have had no problem with this question. So these are students who are likely to become frustrated because just applying things by rote, A, is not very intellectually stimulating. B, if you don't understand why you're applying these procedures, it's not very interesting and plus you're bound to run into problems because you won't be able to take this into a different context and apply it. So the remarks that I told you in the beginning about physics being boring or not understanding physics and being frustrated, I mean 40% in my class is bound to have that experience. So that's when I finally asked myself the question that I said in the beginning at my first confession that I should have asked myself, what should I do? And the first thing that came up in my mind was, well, maybe I should teach graduate courses and stop <laughs> teaching undergraduate <laughs> courses. But I wasn't willing to give up that much. And the solutions presented itself serendipitously, like most good things in my life, including the black silicon that you heard. It was a serendipitous discovery in my lab. They happened by accident. I told you that I was afraid that students would be offended by the simplicity of this FCI. They weren't offended at all. They were horrified by how poorly they'd done. They knew they had this midterm coming up. They asked me to organize a special session where we would go through every single question on the FCI. So I booked one of the classrooms in the Science Center at Harvard from 7 to 10. We spent three hours going through every single question. When I got to that, that question of the heavy truck and the light car, I decided, okay, I'm going to make a free body diagram showing all the forces on the car there and on the truck there. I drew the forces of gravity, the force of the road up, and then I drew the force of the car on the truck and the truck on the car. And I said, by Newton's third law, these two forces are equal in magnitude. <laughs> what else is there to say, right? So I turned around and I could at once see that there was a problem. You know, you could see from the expressions of the students. So I thought, I, I thought, let me ask, is, does anybody have any question? They were so confused they couldn't articulate a question. You, you know how it is, right? I mean, if, if you're, sometimes it's hard to articulate your own confusion. You know, they were at that stage, right? So I said, this is a problem, so I better, I better do this again. So I, I redid it, and this time I brought in acceleration. I thought, look, even though the forces are equal in magnitude, the truck is much heavier, therefore that force is going to have less effect and the truck is going to accelerate less or decelerate less than, than, the, uh, than the car. I thought that was a brilliant way of addressing their misconceptions. So I turned around triumphantly only to see that they looked even more confused. <laughs> 
and I, I was out of ammunition. They still could not articulate any, any questions. So, but I knew one thing. I knew that about half of them had answered it correctly on the FCI. So I did something I'd never done in my class. I said, why don't you discuss it amongst yourselves? It was a classroom as full as here with maybe even more people. It exploded in total chaos. And they forgot about me. It was something I'd never seen in a classroom because I would always, you know, lecture and, uh, and I would stop and say, does anybody have a question? Anybody? <laughs> Students look down, they don't even want to make eye contact, <laughs> right? And if you wait long enough, it's always the same person in the front row, reluctantly. I mean, it's just no interaction at all, right? Here they were all talking. And what happened was really surprising. Within two minutes, they sorted it out. At first I thought, how is that possible? I spent five minutes and <laughs> unsuccessfully, and they talked two minutes and figure it out. But imagine you have two students sitting next to each other, John and Mary. Mary has the right answer because she understands it. John does not. On average, Mary is more likely to convince John than the other way around. But, and I think this is really the crux of the matter, Mary is more likely to convince John than Professor Mazur in front of the class there. Because she has only recently learned it and still sort of has a feeling for what the conceptual difficulties has, are that the beginning learner has. Whereas Professor Mazur learned it such a long time ago, to him it's so obvious that it becomes difficult to understand what problems a beginning learner can have. You would think that the more you advance in your career, the more qualified you become as a teacher. I'm sort of making the opposite argument. The less qualified you become, because the harder it becomes to understand the problems of beginning learning. I don't know if it is like this here, but at Harvard it's often the graduate students who help teaching that win the biggest praise from students, and I think that's one of the reasons. So I thought, is there a way that I can exploit this interaction? And I decided, if we think of education as a two-step process, right? One, transfer of information. Two, assimilation of the information. And we ask ourselves, which of those two parts is the hardest? I think we'd all agree, it's that second part. Isn't it ironic that in the traditional approach to teaching, we put all of the effort on the easy step, leaving the hard part to the students? Shouldn't we, especially in the information age, shouldn't we do it the other way around? Leave the information gathering to the students. They can watch a video, they can read a book, I mean, they can do so many things. I mean, take a lecture. What would be lost by just filming the lecture, putting it on the web and having students look at it? What would be lost? You'd say, well, the interaction is lost, but we already argued, there is hardly any interaction. Online, you could have the students interact about the video by annotating it and asking questions. And I'm sure you'd get more questions than you would in a normal classroom. Also, students could look at it whenever it's convenient to them, whenever they're in the right mindset. Right? You, wouldn't, you wouldn't need this to, to have the synchronous component of education focused on that. So I think you'd lose very little. But why give students more responsibility for guarding information? Well, so that we can better help them assimilate when we are together with them. And the way I do that is by assigning pre-class reading. You can talk about that more if you want. And in class, I focus on depths, not on coverage. It's the reading that determines the coverage, not what I do in the classroom. And I do that by questioning rather than by telling. Nothing new, Socrates over 2,000 years ago already said we should teach by questioning, not by telling. Here we are in the 21st century, still mostly uh, telling. So what is a concept test? I'll come in, I'll talk a few minutes, and then I project a question, and I give the students some time to think about it. Then they answer individually, and then I tell them, turn to a neighbor, see if the neighbor has a different answer. If not, then find another neighbor, find somebody who has a different answer, and then try to convince that person of your answer. Then there's this chaotic discussion, and they answer again, and then an explanation. And then I repeat the process over and over. If the question was too easy, I put a harder question. If the question was too hard, I put an easier question. If the topic of that concept is understood, I switch to questions on a new topic. So basically, when I walk into the classroom, I have 10 or 12 questions of which I maybe do between 6 and 8. Let me show you a little video of how this works in practice. So we have a rectangular loop that is placed in a uniform magnetic field in the direction indicated by these arrows. So the question is, 
what are the magnetic forces on the four different sides of this loop. So take a minute to think about this and then enter your answers. So they think, I don't let them talk to each other. I want them to each commit to an answer individually. We have a disagreement clearly here. Good. So turn to your neighbor and see if you can convince one another of the correct choice. Right. It goes out of the page and on the top it goes in, so they cancel each other out. There is a torque. There is a torque. How do you know that? I said torque. I said torque. Aha uh -huh moment. <laughs> Initially we had sort of an even split. And now we have an absolutely overwhelming majority for choice number two. So what is happening here? One is it's active, not passive. You cannot sleep through class. Some students actually complain about that, right? Because <laughs> every few minutes your neighbor will start talking to you. The other thing is there's continuous feedback from the students to the instructor. I find out then and there whether or not the students understand the concept. Well, they talk to one another. I don't just stand there. I go and listen in to their explanations. The other thing is that there's not only feedback from the students to the instructor. Normally, I would only find out at the exam how well you know, students that learn. It's not, it's continuous. The other thing is that the students find out where they stand with respect to the class. They get continuous <coughs> formative assessment of their own uh, knowledge. Okay, so is it any good? I'm going to end in a few minutes with the uh, results. Okay, so I'm going to show you some results. Now, you know, physicists often say here are some typical results. The word, the word typical is a code word. It means these are the best data I've ever obtained in my entire <laughs> career. I'm not going to show you typical results. I'm going to show you very atypical results, namely the first year that was implementing peer instruction. I didn't know what would be good questions. Some of my questions were too easy, some were too hard, right? Because the first time you give them, you don't know how they're going to, how they're going to work. So it turns out this is actually my worst data. So here's the pretest. I'm very proud of those data because it's the most reproducible I've, data I've ever obtained in my career. It's just amazing how that pretest has a few percent variation, but I don't know. Maybe it doesn't say that much about me, but more about the admissions office at Harvard. But still, <laughs> it's fun to see how reproducible those data are. So what about the post-test? Well, here is the post-test. And, you know, it's still not the last three bins that are the highest, but it is significantly better than we had before. And yes, we still have some students below the cutoff, 23, but it's significantly better than what I showed you at the beginning of my term. Did I teach to the test? I was so excited by these results in 1991. So I, the American Association of Physics teacher had its annual meeting, summer meeting in Vancouver. I submitted an abstract. Nobody knew about me in education then, so all I got was a contributed talk, eight minutes. I spent four of my precious eight minutes documenting that I had not taught to the test. I wanted to be sure that nobody accused me of yeah, saying, well, you used those questions in class, right? I used none of the questions of the FCI or a question closely related to it in class, on the exams, on any assignment. Anyway, at the end of my talk, somebody raised his hand and he says, he said, don't worry about teaching to the test. We've tried it. It doesn't work. <laughs> so now we've transferred a significantly larger fraction of the population to higher grades. And if we look at that other type of plot that I showed you at the beginning, instead of a, an 8% gain, we now have doubled the gain. It's been 16%. And in fact, in the years since, that data point has marched up by simply having a better selection of questions. And the highest data point was obtained by one of my colleagues, by two of my colleagues when I was on sabbatical. So it has nothing to do with personality or anything else. And other schools who have implemented um, interactive teaching, uh, also all the data, with the exception of one data point, have jumped up. And if we take not just the best data here, but all of these data together, you see that simply implementing interactive teaching doubles the gain on the FCI. Now, the FCI only 
touches on a very small part of the total curriculum in a physics course. It's just, you know, Newton's laws and there's much more to physics. Plus, students still have to be able to solve problems. After all, some are going to go on to medical school, others are going to become engineers. You still have to work out problems, right? If you're an engineer designing a bridge, it's a beautiful bridge, conceptually fine, but the first truck that goes over it makes the bridge collapse because you made an error of factor 100 in the load it can carry, you're in trouble, right? There's no partial credit for that. So <laughs> still have to be able to, to, to work that out. So I, uh, I knew my colleagues were going to ask me, what about problem solving? So how do you answer that question? I thought about it and I thought there's only one way I can really conclusively answer that. And that's by repeating an exam. I had never ever repeated a single question on an exam. At Harvard we keep three years of exams on file in a library so students can go and look at it. Um, and any students who would have access even to all seven years of my exams would have very quickly concluded Professor Mazur never repeats an exam question because that's what I'd done. So I went back but I'd kept meticulous data. I had even entered individual question scores in a database. I'm a database junkie, so I never knew I was going to get into education research, but when I did, I had already eight years of data to, uh, to reanalyze. So I went back to 1985, and I was able to produce this histogram, including histograms for individual questions. I'm not going to show this to you. I'm just going to show the sum. And um, I thought, now, seven years later, or six years later, we can actually repeat this exam. As you see, some students obviously failed the course, other did very well. The average was against 60. Now, that year, 1991, I'm, not going, to I'm going to show you the data in just a second, I prepared myself for actually a performance that would be a little bit worse than this, because I had never, ever done that year a single problem on the blackboard. I decided that year that as a student you derive very little benefit from seeing the back of a professor and watching a professor <coughs> solve problems. In order to learn problem solving you have to do it. I mean you don't learn the piano by popping in CDs of Murray Pariah playing Chopin sonatas. You gotta play the piano. You don't train for a marathon by sitting in front of the TV eating popcorn watching DVDs of marathon runners. You got to do the running. The same is true with problem solving. You have to struggle with the problem in order to learn problem solving. The only thing that happens when a professor solves the problem on the board is that the students copy the solution in their notebooks and maybe look at it later. So I eliminated all problem solving and I said to myself, you know, as long as their problem solving ability doesn't suffer too much, I'm happy because I know they understand the basics better. But you know what? They ended actually doing better. Even though I'd done no problem solving in class, they had still done a lot of problem solving out of class, but none in class. And, you know, the gain is not as big as the gain in conceptual learning, but it's statistically significant to a p-value of 0.01, for, for those of you who are into statistics. So it's, you know, very solid. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a more than 10% gain in the performance. So what does this tell us? This tells us that better understanding leads to better problem solving. Doesn't that make sense, actually, right? <laughs> but now take the inverse of this statement. Good problem solving doesn't necessarily indicate understanding. I mean, think again about that Kirchhoff's Law problem that I solved, that I showed you. Many students were able to solve that without understanding the basics at all, simply by doing rote memorization of a procedure and applying that procedure. All right? So, I had been fooling myself for many years into believing that I was a good teacher based on the students' performance and exam problems but they were just doing them by rote. Uh, let me show you a very short clip about what the students have to say about it. I think the it. lectures were really good and it worked out really well, the idea of everyone teaching each other. You learn the material so much better when you have to teach it. Um, and you are trying to convince the person next to you of your answer, convince them you're right or they're wrong, or trying to find, if you both have the same answer, trying to think of uh, different ways to explain the same thing and you intuitively grasp material better if you have to explain it to someone else. So the nice thing is, once I learned something, I felt like it was committed to memory, and it still is, as opposed to something that I only learned once, or maybe in passing, reading a textbook. So I feel like the difference between that, that teaching style really helped me um, learn the material better while I was learning it, and so I wouldn't have to sort of 
go crazy the night before the exam and, and relearn everything. It was more relaxed studying. Okay, so in conclusion, I think the traditional indicators of success in teaching and of semester evaluation are, I think, very limited assessment is misleading. We have a, card, a house of cards that, you know, it's very easy to uh, poke at and make collapse. And last thing is, I think education is no longer about information. We live in an information age. You know, I think 100 years ago, you had to memorize a lot of things because you couldn't afford to run to the library for every little thing you look up. But nowadays, if I were not to know, let's say, what Planck's constant is, it's no problem because I, I type Planck's constant in Google or I pull up my iPhone, press on the Google button and I say Planck's constant and <laughs> a second later I have it to more digits than I could possibly ever remember, right? The latest value endorsed by the National Bureau of Standards and I can still do my work. So one of the things I've done in my class and I challenge you to consider that in your own classes is to make all assessment open book. My students can bring whatever they want to an exam. Well, they cannot bring another living person. <laughs> that person is okay. But you know, it's, they can bring their laptops, they can bring their cell phones, they can bring whatever they want. I mean, let's think about it actually in a very pragmatic way. Later on in their careers, they'll have access to whatever information they want. So why are we examining them in an environment that is completely artificial that we'll never have to operate on, uh, under, right? It's not about memorizing information, it's about knowing how to use it. And you know, there are two things that happen when you, when you take that step. One is you're sending a very strong message to the students. But second, the impact is much bigger on you as a teacher. Because when I reevaluated my exams, I noticed that a lot of the problems I used to ask were simple regurgitation from the book. I, couldn't, I can't ask those questions anymore because they have access to the book. They can bring whatever they want, right? They couldn't Google the answer to problems. So I have to actually think much harder about a meaningful assessment in the information age. And I think that it has a big impact on the way I assess my uh, students. So if you're interested, this is, uh, I, I forget about the top there. That's, I should remove that slide. Uh, National Science Foundation, I want to acknowledge them for funding. And if you want a copy of this presentation, you can go to that URL. Don't write it down. Because you can go to Google, put in my last name, M-A-Z-U-R, and then hit this I'm feeling lucky button, and then you'll have a copy of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm failing with the technology. Um, thank you very much, Eric. That was, that was fantastic. We've got plenty of time for questions. If you could just wait until I get to you running the line with the microphone uh, before you start speaking, then we can capture the, uh, the questions on the, on the webcast. Karen. Yeah, so I, um, I, um, I give them a textbook. I mean, why use a textbook to teach from and not give them access, right? I mean, that's sort of not using the textbook to its full potential. So I used, uh, I used first other textbooks, which I gave to the students. Now I use a textbook that I've been developing for a long while. In fact, I, I make the manuscript available to them right now electronically on a social document annotation system. So it's, they, they, can, they can either print it if they want, but they're encouraged to, to interact with the text in the following way. You, 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 you log onto a web server, which you can do on a laptop, on an iPad, on, even on an iPhone if you want, except that the screen is kind of small. You can read it, and if you don't understand something, you can drag your cursor over it and annotate it. You can post a question that other people in the class can see. They don't know it's from you. It's just posted as anonymously unless you choose to sign it. And I encourage students to both post questions and answer each other's questions. 
So before class, what happens is that they interact with the, the text and answer each other's questions. Uh, I give them a few bonus points and you know, bonus points, <laughs> I don't know about the students here, but in the US, if you give them bonus points, you could make them memorize the yellow pages. I mean, <laughs> they'll do anything. Um, and then the other thing I do is that I have them answer three questions online. So before each class period, there are two in a week, they have to read half a chapter, annotate the, the, uh, the manuscript, which means that all the students are becoming co-authors of my book, right? And, uh, and secondly, they have to answer three questions online. Two questions deal with the content and they're really hard. They're not the type of questions where you can have the question here, the book, and just look up the answer and then plug it in. No, it's, you have to take the information in the book and apply it in a different context, in a way that, you know, the book hasn't pushed you to think yet. You may say, that's unfair, most students won't get it right, and that's right, most students won't get it right. But I tell the students, your goal is to convince me, by the thought you put in your answer, that you've done the reading. Right? It's not whether you get it correct or not, it's your effort. The last question is always the same. Please tell us what you found difficult or confusing in the text. If you did not find anything difficult or confusing, tell us what you found most interesting. So the night before class, I press on a button on my website and out comes the pictures and the names of the students with what they found difficult or confusing. I take that information and then the next day in class, I summarize the points that they found confusing and then I start asking questions, often bouncing back the questions that they had at them. So the questions I ask in class now are the questions that they communicate to me. So what's the effect? Well, first of all, 10% of the course credit is completing this assignment. If you don't do it, you lose 10%, which you cannot make up anyway. Even if you ace all of your exams, you cannot make it up, right? So you go from a 10 to a 9, a 9 to an 8, and so forth. So that's the stick. But the carrot is that if you take the effort of communicating to me what is difficult, there's a good chance that the next day in class we'll actually go over it. So that's what I do. Have your Nobel Prize winning colleagues at, in physics at Harvard changed their learning and teachings, their teaching styles as a consequence of the data and the evidence that you've produced? Most of them have retired. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, we were actually discussing that this afternoon and you know, you're never really a prophet in your own country. But something interesting has happened because I've been, I've been at this now for 19 years and it's I really did this to solve a problem in my class. I never imagined I'd be talking about this in Edinburgh or anywhere else. I mean, in fact, it's crazy how often I, I'm invited to speak about this. I never thought that, you know, I'd write a book and talk at conferences and, and so on. But what has happened is that it's been adopted in other disciplines and by other departments. So I'll have colleagues who are invited to give a colloquium at Stanford and, you know, months before there, I've been there talking about education and when they visit they say, hey, we're using uh, your colleague Eric Mazur's method in our introductory courses. And of course they don't know anything about it, so they're very surprised and they come back and they say, I hear that at Stanford they're using what you, what is it that you're doing? Right, so the message has gone from Harvard outside back into Harvard. <laughs> Um, and now what is happening all is that many of the departments at Harvard from statistics to sociology to chemistry to biology are teaching interactively. Still I find physicists some of the most uh, hard to change communities that one could uh, possibly uh, imagine. So I think in all fairness, I've had probably less impact at Harvard than outside of Harvard. But that's fine. You know, I, I don't want to have to live until retirement with a colleague who, who says to me, I tried your method, it stinks, or my evaluations went down, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, I was just going to wonder, like, do you think this idea of interactive learning can be universally applied to any course or does it lend itself better to say more conceptually difficult courses than 
as a student, you know, a course that overloads you with information, this idea of a tutorial format for lectures could be a bit time wasting. Like, it, is it more no, appropriate it for time wasting? I'm sorry. Um, so you're saying rather than having a standard lecture, you talk to me. Um, you're taking a learning, uh, you know, rather than remembering approach, which I think is good. But by the very nature, some courses just seem to bound you with, you know, reams and reams of information. And I gather that in the time you've got with students, you can only tackle X amount of problems. Yeah. Well, but think about it, right? <coughs> Learning is not very different at any level, right? So if there's anything that's conceptually difficult, it's much better to struggle with the material yourself than to just listening to somebody deliver the information. Also, I mean, why are we putting all of this effort in reenacting the same courses year after year after year if there's so little coming back from the students to us? What would be lost by just filming it and putting it on the web and using it maybe 10 years in a row, right? There's no need to actually spend, because think about it, it's actually very precious time that you're spending one-on-one -on -one with the, well, not one-on-one, -on -one, one on many, but face-to-face -face with the students. So that time, that precious time where everybody's together at the same time should be used for something really useful rather than something that could easily be replicated any other way with a textbook, with a video clip, with an audio clip, you name it. So I would say any course where there's a resource available for transmitting the information for that course should probably be taught this way or for smaller courses I have actually a very different approach. I can talk about that in just a second. So that, eliminate, that, that basically probably holds for 99% of all of our courses. Maybe some very advanced courses where there is not yet a book, right, is the only exception. But anything else, you know, I teach every other summer, I teach at a summer school, NATO Advanced Study Institute in Italy, where, you know, from all over the world, about 70 participants come, 35 of them are professors, 35 are graduate students and postdocs, it's very high level, and uh, it's two weeks, and each lecturer, of which I'm one, teaches seven hours of advance, in this case it's spectroscopy, and I noticed in these schools, after I switched my approach to teaching, that you know, after I deliver my lecture, I become a participant. It's very hard to listen to people for seven hours, right? And let's say that somewhere in hour three, you lose track of what the lecturer is trying to say. Well, four, fifth, six, seventh hour, you're basically tuned out completely. So I decided to make those interactive too, slightly differently from what I just described, but they're interactive. It's been a smash hit. You have to be a little bit careful with the egos of professors, right? They're not that willing to admit that they're wrong. Uh, and it becomes often like eraser fight if you just try peer instruction <laughs> with them. Uh, but, but it works. People like to be doing things rather than passive receivers of, of uh, information. So when I have a really small course, let's say six or 10 or 14 students, I use a slightly different approach. I still give them the book. We sit around a table and I use what is called the seminar method. The students have to teach the course. Most of my time I spend helping them prepare for their presentations and evaluating their presentations. So each class there are two students presenting, one 20 minute followed by a 10 minute discussion, another 20 minutes followed by another student presenting for 20 minutes followed by another 10 minute discussion. I help the students who present prepare, that's my quality control, and afterwards I meet with them to discuss what they presented. The students who are not presenting are engaged because they're evaluated on their discussion skills. If they don't ask questions, they don't earn points. A stupid question is actually worth more points than no question, so they have to raise their hands. And they have to learn because their lectures are going to follow on the ones that are being presented. Right? So they're, they're, you've got to understand what has been said before if you teach the next week. Uh, and I've used that method now for five years in smaller classes with great success. But again, it's the same idea, right? Don't focus on the information transfer. Focus on the engagement and participation. And at the same time, train skills that are, I think are extremely important. We could probably, let, let's, do we have a second to do a small exercise? Take a little piece of paper and a pen. Everybody. <coughs> Thank you.
I'm going to ask you to write down something on a piece of paper and you can be totally brutally honest because we're not going to do anything with it. I just want you to commit it to paper and then fold it. You will not have to reveal it to anyone. Okay? But I do want you to, I want the act of commitment there. What I would like you to do is to think of something, think of something you're really, really good at. Something that has advanced you in your career. You know, it could, be, it could be solving partial differential equations. It could be analyze, critically analyzing readings. It could be, it could be making Bernays saws. It could be entertaining people. It could be, it could be uh, oral presentation skills. But something that you're proud of and something that you know has helped you become successful in your career. So I'm going to give you one minute to write something now. You're not allowed to look at your, what your neighbor writes down. <laughs> as soon as you write it down, fold it up, okay? Okay, so, does everybody have something on paper or something? I mean, you're all successful people, so it shouldn't be too hard to come up with something. Now think about the context in which you became good at whatever it is you wrote down. What is it that made you become good? How did you learn it? How did you improve it? How did you become somebody who excels at doing whatever it is that you wrote down? Where did you learn it? And how? Write that down too. So, does everybody have something on paper? Yeah? How many of you wrote down lecture? <laughs> I see no hands. Uh, none. Occasionally, I, when I do this, I do this exercise. I, I, I presume, I think you probably wrote down, you know, some over on apprenticeship, other by, by trying or by making mistakes or, you know, by studying it. But all active things, nobody, I mean, all of the, and we all agree, this is an important skill, right? You wrote, I asked you to write down something that was important in your career. So there are a lot of skills that are very important in our careers that we don't learn in any formal way. Like, for example, oral presentation skills. Where do we learn those? There's no formal training for it. So using that seminar method, this sort of wraps up my very long answer to your question, you know, we actually have an opportunity to develop these other skills. Sometimes they're called soft skills. I don't like that because I don't know really what soft skill is. I mean, but discussion skills, presentation skills, and so on. That's why... I'm, I'm very grateful that you all helped drive the final nail in the coffin of the lecture. <laughs> now, notice, by the way, nobody pointed this out yet, but I lectured to you. <laughs> and, you know, I love lecturing, but I don't have an opportunity to do it in my classroom anymore, so I'm really very grateful that you invited <laughs> me to come and lecture here. <laughs> Has the, your, your change, your conversion, affected the way you use land spaces? There's quite a lot of discussion about how land spaces give themselves <coughs> to better teaching or better learning. For instance, in my institution, uh, most of the teaching is done, the lecture is done, is very, in very big lecture theatres. And even in the tutorial rooms, chairs are stuck together. You cannot take them apart, so you cannot create an environment where people will be able to talk to each other. Yeah, I'm very, very good question. And you know, I mean, the learning spaces are designed with the sole purpose of focusing the attention of many on one, which is the opposite of what you want to do in a 
interactive session, in, in, interactive setting, one in which the focus is not on the instructor but on the students. So, what I have done is I'm, I'm just living with whatever space is available, but I would love to design better spaces. I mean, just making these cha chairs rotate would help, right? Uh, and there are many other inventive approaches. There's a nice space that I saw in the physics department here that is stu student focused rather than <clears throat> instructor focused. Um, I hope that we can begin to revise our, our spaces. I'm not 100% sure what the best design is yet. I think that is something that we're st that's still evolving. In the business schools and law schools, instructors don't lecture. They all use the case study method and the learning space is designed so that, you know, students sit almost in a circle or in, a, in, a, in an almost closed oval with the instructor facilitating the discussion between the students. In fact, there's a lot of parallels between the case study method and what I do. The case study method, you prepare yourself by reading a case, and then in class, the instructor says, you, what was the market value, what do you think the market value of that company should be, and then uh, do you agree, and, you know, and basically moderates a discussion between the students but a lot of the preparatory work takes place outside of the classroom. And the space is very nice because students can see each other. It's, it's, there's only three rows, there's still a hundred students. I don't know if you've ever gone to a business uh, uh, class, case study, lecture or class, I should say. There's three rows and there's a slot in front where students put a, a name tag with big letters like this so that you can at once see what the names are of the other students in the classroom and the instructor can also call on you by name. Uh, I think that's an attempt at actually uh, making much better use of the space. Uh, a, a class that seats 100 is actually barely bigger than this room, but it's much more intimate because instead of all facing towards the front, they face each other. But again, I, uh, I mean, it's expensive to redesign learning spaces and uh, as long as most instructors still lecture, I think there will be a need for designing traditional spaces. I, very important problem. I, I don't have a, a ready solution. <coughs> You've shown significant learning gains. Uh, what was the reaction of the students come the end of the course? Please. Very good question. So my, my evaluation has not changed. I, I think, you know, the evaluation measures very different things, maybe charisma or whatever. There's a very interesting study by Abadi and others in the psychology department at Harvard where they took video clips of, this was done in the 80s, video clips of instructors and showed them to students asking them to rate the professor and then compared the rating, turned the sound off, so it was just looking at gesticulation, and then, and then compared the average ratings by looking at the video to the student end of semester rating. They found a very strong correlation with 30 second clip and then slowly started to reduce the length of the clip. Down to two seconds, the shortest duration they tested, they found a very strong correlation. So that means students make up their minds very quickly. It has nothing to do with what is actually being said or the content. <laughs> It's the way, you know, we're biologically pre-programmed really to evaluate other human beings and, and, and rank them. So my ratings have not changed. Something has changed, however, the nature of the remarks that they make. I have not a single student who writes down Professor Mazur lectures straight from his lecture notes. <laughs> I have taken care of that remark. That's gone. <laughs> that doesn't mean that they don't complain. There are still complaints. What do they write down now? Now they write down, Professor Mazur is not teaching us anything. We have to learn it all ourselves. <laughs> I'm just following up on your last remark. Do you find there's any students that really... I beg your pardon? Following up? Following up on your last remark, do you find there's any students that really don't engage with this at all or have problems with this? Because obviously it is hard work. Yeah, it's hard work and, and they, I certainly, I ask them actually to put, I tell them, look, you know, you got to put in work anyway. The traditional approach is, you know, 
I'll wait till I was reading the book until I really have to, just a week or two before the exam, right? But you can either read just before the exam, or you can read after class to understand what happened in class, or you can read it before class to prepare yourself for class. It's going to cost you the same amount of time. I tell the students, when are you going to get the most benefit? Before, right? Uh, and and uh, I convince some, but definitely not all. And there are some students who will sit alone in the classroom so that they can't turn to their neighbor because there is no neighbor. Well, that I take care of by basically having my teaching staff and myself go at them. I say, if you sit alone, we'll come and talk to you. <laughs> well, next time they sit close to somebody else. Uh, I think that, that in the beginning there is a lot of resistance from the students because they have done well up to then under the old system, right? They have earned their five on the advanced placement course and they have gotten into Harvard by doing well on mostly traditional classes. So their expectations of how they learn and how the teachers should teach are not very different from most of our own point of views before, and mine, before I, uh, I converted. So I have students who will write me an angry note midway in the semester say, I think you should lecture because that's how I learn. And you know, and then I have to tell them, I love lecturing, come to my class, I'll write the book on the board and you can copy it. And, and, and eventually I think I convince most of them, but certainly never all of them. I, show, I share actually some of the anecdotes and show them some of the data. Right? In the back. observation in your, um, in your talk that uh, really um, now students don't have to come to us to get information because basically information is readily available. In fact, they're probably better than us in finding information on the web. And so I was listening to your, your method and I couldn't help to um, wonder that most of the things that you do could actually just be implemented on the web. I mean, you could also have forums where people talk to each other, there could be somebody that oversees everything. So, um, have you thought at all about, you know, how relevant is the whole structure of university education and do you think that that's going to evolve in time? I have thought about it a lot and I'm glad you raised that question because I think it's a very important question. You can indeed replicate a lot of this online and I've done it. I taught over the summer a course in South Africa. I've never been in South Africa. and. Um, they invited me to talk about, give a workshop on peer instruction. I, I, I couldn't fit it in my schedule. Uh, and I said, how about doing this online via Illuminate? Somebody mentioned the word Illuminate before. Is that how you're webcasting it? This? But apparently some people here are using Illuminate too. Um, and um, I had, um, these were professors at different universities. It, st it was uh, organized by uh, the University in Pretoria, but the, all over the country there were faculty participating and I thought if I am going to give a workshop on peer instruction and just-in-time teaching I should actually uh, I should actually use those techniques to teach about it rather than just lecturing I mean lecture is good to get enthusiasm going but if you really want to get into the nitty-gritty you should use those methods also to teach those methods so I, I had the difficulty however that at some universities there were you know, maybe four or five people, but then there were a number of campuses where there was only one person participating. So when I would tell the audience, now turn to your neighbor, there would be some people at some universities who had nobody to turn to. So then we started to use chat on Illuminate as a chat function. And as an instructor, you can moni monitor the, the chat activity. So I would say, if you're alone in that campus, then you should talk to this person. And, you know, so I paired them up. And it was amazing to see the engagement at a distance. That being said, I think, you know, deep, deep down, learning is a social activity. And it's very hard to, to reproduce online the same social interactions you have in reality. Why is a university education, why is Harvard Harvard, for example? It's not because of the buildings. It's not because of the professors. It's not because of the Nobel laureates or whatever. It's because of the students. And the benefits comes from students interacting with one another. So I think, I think that we're not going to move 
our universities into second life or you know completely online it there's well, always especially i think for you know the best and the brightest the future leadership of society there's going to be a need to be together physically and learn from each other and be together in different different contexts within the university both social ones and you know extracurricular ones and and uh, discipline based ones so I think there will always be a need for a university. And in fact, the discussion that's going on now is not that different from the one that went on shortly after Gutenberg invented the printing press. Faculty were horrified. What was going to happen to the university? Before that, the universities had the monopoly on information. The book was a threat, just as now the internet is a threat or seen as a threat. Well, books did the opposite, right? They, they, made, they made universities prosper. But if you look back at the publishing industry, most of the original publishers were all affiliated with university. Cambridge University Press, Oxford University Press, Elsevier, which was Leiden University Press, you name it. Because the universities wanted to control the presses because they didn't want that monopoly to, to go away. So it hasn't gone away. Here we are 500 years later, but the information revolution really started 500 years ago with the book. So I think we just have to figure out how to best use the tools of the information age. And, and when I say the tools of the information age, I really mean the book itself, too. So I think, yes, you can replicate some of the aspects online. But I think, ultimately, the education will still require people to come together. So when we see this sort of talk, people always talk about uh, Newtonian mechanics. Do you think that conceptually that's the hardest thing that there is in physics? I mean, after all, it was up to the 17th century before anybody figured it out. When I came running down here today, I, you know, being a physicist, I just sort of took two steps and then just glided along at constant velocity till I arrived, which was nice. Most people can't do that. <laughs> yeah, OK, so back to physics here. No, I don't, think, I don't think Newtonian physics is the hardest thing conceptually. It is very difficult, and it took humanity, what, many centuries to, to formalize. Well, one person, of course, did it eventually, Newton. But I think, you know, quantum mechanics is conceptually very, very difficult. And, and I think many, many trained physicists still have trouble wrapping their heads around, around certain quantum mechanical phenomena. And, I, and, and I, I don't think that physics is conceptually more difficult than any other discipline. I think in every discipline you can find things that are conceptually uh, difficult. I think we expect quantum mechanics to be hard. I beg your pardon? There's an expectation that quantum mechanics and relativity will be hard, whereas I think students, when they come here, think that Newtonian mechanics is boring and simple and straightforward, even though they don't understand right. it. So no. the gap between the expectation I, oh, I see and the reality mean. is what yeah. I meant, rather than... You know, yeah. the maybe they think it's boring because um, I, I, I don't know. I think maybe it's, they th I think they think it's boring. It comes back to what I said earlier. It's perceived as being boring because the focus in most courses is on rote application of the principles without understanding. Intellectually, if you stop to think about it, it, it you know, it, it's a phenomenal achievement of Newton to have put together that framework of, of Newtonian mechanics. And I would say each time I teach it and I discuss these questions with my students, I, I sharpen my own understanding. There's some, something that clicks somewhere, something that I, that, you know, was not completely sticking together that, that I elucidate. So I, I think if you really focus on understanding Newtonian mechanics, it's not boring at all. There's a lot of beauty in thinking about classical mechanics. Um, and, and how, how it applies consistently uh, among many of the things that we observe, as long as we don't get to the atomic scale or the relativistic scale. So I, I, I think the problem that many students see it as boring is because the focus is on road memorization and application of these principles without understanding, because a lot of them have intuitive beliefs that clash with Newtonian mechanics like the heavy truck and the light car. The truck is heavier, so it must exert a larger force on the light car than the other way around. Yet if you ask them how do F, A, B, and F, B, A 
f of a on b and b on a compare, they'll all say, well, they're equal by Newton's third law. But there's no real understanding of how that statement can be consistent with some in the, of these intuitive beliefs that people have. And then, therefore, they just focus on the road application, and yeah, that's boring. Yeah, yeah.